believe it is our responsibility to resist the injustices done by our government in our names. We pledge to bring about justice, freedom, and peace. Another world is possible, and we pledge to make it real. This is Anarchist. Welcome to Anarchast. This is our first live edition of Anarchast. We're at the Toronto Resource Show. I'm with Redmond Weisenberger, who just founded Mises Canada in November of 2010. Yes, yeah, founded uh, the Mises, the Ludwig von Mises Institute of Canada in uh, November 2010. We're the Centre for the Study of Austrian Economics within Canada. Um, so, uh, you know, we incorporated uh, in about February, we got our charitable status. Uh, so we're actually at operating as a charity, charitable organization within Canada. To, to work to spread the uh, teachings of the Austrian school. Well, it's a charity, so people can donate and then actually yes. get a tax write-off. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, not that I support paying taxes, but if yes, you do pay taxes, yes. well, if, if you want to support the criminal government. Yeah, well, that's it. Was it was kind of funny actually? Some people, uh, uh, when we went out to our first conference uh, just in Calgary, it was liber called Liberty and Oil: uh, The Foundations of Modern Civilization. Um, apparently, some of the anarcho-capitalists were quite angry that uh, that we had gotten tax, you know. Tax yeah, that's what I was trying to think if I like it or not. I, well, I'm trying to see which side I want to be on that one. I, I think the case is that the case is, uh, you know, get as much money back from the government as you can. I support that. Right. I mean, if you're if you're going to be giving money to the institute of uh, the Mises Institute, then why not, you know, get a little bit of extra money sure. back from the. Uh, no, I, from I the definitely support that. Uh, it's, it's interesting. If you, so, how did you come about founding the Mises Institute? You just made a call down to. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah. Obviously, I mean, what you've seen over the last year or so, um, since uh, you know, since the Mises Institute really started making an impact, is uh, around the world. Uh, you've had Mises Institutes opening in Brazil. You've had them opening in, um, in Poland, uh, Sweden. Oh. You know, all sorts of places where you wouldn't necessarily expect, uh, you know, sort of these uh, socialist, you know, these these social democratic welfare states that are supposedly, you know, that everyone is supposed to look to. At least in Canada, the United States, you know, it's sort of Sweden this, Sweden that. Um, you know, even though they have their parallel private healthcare system, which we of course do not. Um, but anyway, so you know, you've got these uh, Mises institutes opening around the world, and I was, you know, I was uh, on Facebook. Um, somebody had posted that they were going to start the, uh, you know, the Mises Institute of Poland. Uh, I think Jeff Tucker posted, you know, the Mises Institute of Poland has just launched. And so what I did was I, I said I'm going to post the, I'm going to, I'm going to start the Mises Institute of Canada. Um, I then emailed Jeff Tucker, emailed Lou Rockwell, said I'm starting this. They were like, congratulations, <laughs> go for it. I mean, they have. You know, their view of intellectual property obviously lends itself to, to that sort of model of an organic growth around the world, right? Um, That's great. Yeah, and then just got in touch with Doug French and uh, sort of went just from there. went from there. Yep. That's great. Well, for anarchists out there who don't know a lot about Austrian economics, I consider Austrian economics to be the anarchist economic uh, plan <laughs> basically is free market economics and yeah. and uh, we were talking earlier I came more from the freedom side the more just libertarian anti-government side and uh, you actually got into this more from the actual the the Austrian economic side is that correct yeah well um, well and, and to the point that um, you know Austrian economics is, is anarchist and economics uh, Murray Rothbard of course the great uh, Austrian scholar he coined the term anarcho-capitalist, right? Um, but yeah, so what, what I did was, uh, you know, I think it was almost 10 years ago uh, or so. I mean, I'd always been reading about history. I'd always been reading about politics and very interested in these sorts of things. Um, and, you know, you always hear about, oh, capitalism this, capitalism that. Uh, so I, what I decided to do was I picked up, um, I picked up uh, Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations because I sort of, I mean, Anybody out there, you know, it, you know, within our within our sort of controlled media system, if you're going to hear about anybody in the free market, it's going to be Adam Smith. Everybody knows the term "invisible hand," these sorts of things. I mean, you know, they may not fair. laissez faire. You know, you might you might hear these terms, and, and so I went back. I just went back to Adam Smith because you know I started at the beginning. Yeah, I started at the beginning. Um, 
and uh, it was uh, so I, I sort of went from there. I, I was involved in uh, investing during the tech bubble, right? So of course, you know, you make some money, you lose some money, and, and after that, I sort of stayed away from investing because I realized I didn't know enough about what was going on. Me um, either. Yeah. <laughs> then, <laughs> I lost a lot in the tech bubble. Yeah, you know. And I then, wish I knew about the uh, Austrian business cycle theory yeah, back in 1999. Yeah, for sure, man. The uh, and so then, um, but then I, you know, I got out of school. I was in the working world. Um, I was sort of working uh, in the industrial design field. Um, so uh, we were designing residential lighting. So it was manufactured here, uh, or no, designed here and then manufactured in China. And so what, what that got me was a really good hands-on exposure to the international trading system. And so I got to see the way that, I got to see uh, the way that uh, currency fluctuations would affect our, our business model. Um, the way that uh, oil, you know, the price of oil would go up and down. I would got to see the, uh, the price of zinc would shift up and down. That would affect our pricing models. Um, and then also, of course, I got to actually get an experience of, ch of what China is like, you know, because we... Oh, you went over to China? Yeah, I went over to China, um, sort of in the, the Pearl River Delta area. So oh, Guangzhou, Hong, yeah, yeah, Guangzhou. So Shenzhen. I used to live in Panyu. Have you heard of Panyu? No well, one's heard of. Well, I was in Pingzhou, <laughs> which is sort of near a place called Guchen, and it's just outside of Guangzhou. Yeah. Now, and and it was it was very interesting because you know you, you know you hear the rhetoric about, you know we we have freedom here, um, and then that that place is a dictatorship, but you know when I was actually there, I found that you know in a lot of ways, uh, I mean they don't have this uh, sort of overbearing nanny state. No. that we do here, right? So I got to experience... Although they're trying now. Have you heard about ah. it? They're starting to... Uh, they want to make pensions well, and stuff, ah, well, and social security wait, system. I should, say, I should say, except for the one-child policy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, that's, that's, the, that's a fairly big exception. <laughs> though, um, though if you're rich enough now, you can buy your way out of it. Yes, you of know? course. Well, you can always get around government you yeah. know, with money, luckily. But well, that's, well, that's what I had heard. Uh, I mean, I think uh, this old Czech guy who... Um, this old Czech guy who uh, worked with us designing lights. He said that actually out in the farms, like out, outside of the main centers, people people were having more than two children, or more, more, more than I one children, that, but yeah. they just weren't telling anybody. Right. You know, it's sort of the further you get away from Beijing, right. you know, the you know the easier it is to sort of live your life. The way you Same thing to. in Washington. Yeah. <laughs> Try to dance at the Jefferson Memorial. And yeah. <laughs> they're all there. All the all the criminals are all gathered there like ants. Yeah. So so but after you know so. <laughs> But also, what was interesting about being within the um, within this sort of residential lighting, it was very closely tied to the housing bubble, right? Because right All at right. this time, you know, we're designing, you know, sort of mid-range residential lighting. So of course, what is everywhere? You've got um, you've got TV shows talking about flipping your house. You've got let's renovate this house. We're going to sell it. You know, so people were borrowing money so they could purchase things like lighting, like furniture. So in a very, in a very, a big way, we were getting a, um, you know, a dividend, let's say, from the housing bubble. This, this sort of field was right, getting a yes. dividend from the housing bubble, right? Um, you know, because certain people get, you know, for certain people get the first crack at that new money. And whether it's the banks, they lend it to the people, the people borrow against their house, spend it on new furnishings, flip the house. And, you know, so it's sort of, we were within that sort of bubble in a way. Um, so yeah, so I so I got a got a really good hands-on um, sort of experience there, and then I ended up working in sort of architecture, high-end architectural design, and you know we we're you know and, and while I was well actually while I was at the while I was in the uh, the lighting industry, you know I, I could see the you know I was watching the housing market and I could see this is a bubble you know because I I I had seen enough of of the tech bubble that I uh, I watched this and I said. Wow, something else is going on here, you know, and you know, it's just it was just almost. Ben Bernanke still hasn't figured it out. Yeah, well, I, I couldn't believe I I couldn't believe that uh, you know, and then and then it popped, right? And and around that time, I guess uh, I sort of I've been you know ever since George Bush. Not I mean not that Al Gore would have been any better or John Kerry, but after George Bush got his won his second uh, election, I sort of tuned out completely just from politics completely. Um, but then I decided I wanted to start getting back into it, um, and somehow, uh, you know, I happened upon Alex Jones, oh, yeah. <laughs> of all people, and He's I started... The Walter Cron Cronkite of our generation. Yeah, I, I started listening to him, um, you know, and, uh, and, he, and he had started having some, you know, he talked to Ron Paul, 
uh, he started having some guys on um, talking about you know the Federal Reserve creating money out of thin air and then I started I, and I wanted to learn more about it um, at the same time I'd also been uh, I've been doing a lot of research uh, on the environmental movement and sort of the global warming movement um, you know because and then you know once you start to realize that that whole thing is, is a, sort of a sham um, sort of it's sort of a sham uh, I mean that that plays into sort of you know the UN and the globalization movement. That's that's a whole other. I mean we could talk yeah, about that. Yeah, that's another hour. whole other anarchist. We could talk for you know <laughs> hours on that. Um, but uh, yeah, so you know I started listening to Alex Jones for a bit, like listen to his podcast and whatnot. Uh, I was sort of, I, I mean I think I focus more on sort of the the economic issues, right? Because I, you know. Um, What's your background? Uh, was it like like? Did you go to school? In yeah. Camps well, what was funny is that I mean, I well, that's a funny thing, right? I uh, I did uh, fine art okay. at <laughs> at school. Useless, isn't it? Yeah. Well, except <laughs> okay. um, except I, I avoided any of the uh, I avoided all of the uh, theory classes. I just did hands on. Okay. And actually, you'd be surprised if um, in if you continue if you if you become a very talented uh, painter in sort of the the realist style like the sort of classical you know late 19th century high French style I mean there's a, there's actually a lot of money to be made out there yeah. that sort of thing yeah no but yeah but <laughs> but modern you know quote unquote government funded art as it stands today oh. is but at the same time what I realized when I was in you know speaking of capitalists um, you know, to some extent, artists uh, are the biggest capitalists around, but they don't even realize it. I mean, most of them sort of these leftists, but when it comes down to it, they're taking a product that's you know that it's completely subjective. There's right. all, no objective they value. They created it for nothing. They created for nothing, and then they have to get people to buy it. Right. You know, or they have they have to create perceive they have to create value in something that you know is the beauty is completely in the eye of the beholder. Right. And, and when you look at the, and when you, you look at the, the gallery system that was built up, I'm, I live in Toronto, um, and if you look at the gallery system that was created here, uh, it was all done by independent, um, it was all done by uh, sort of, uh, you know, independent um, operators. They would rent or buy stores, start galleries up, build the clientele, you know, bring in the artists, so they re they were really you know real entrepreneurs, wow. but you know they may not you know they may not understand of themselves as being capitalists, but they are. You know, that's that's, that's the funny thing right there, and it's again it's completely subjective. But so then, um, so through my my explorations, you know, finding out about Alex Jones, um, you know, and then environmentalism, I sort of uh, happened upon a blog. Uh, he shared my views on environmentalism. This guy Ray Harvey, he was very much into uh, the Austrian School of Economics, essentially like a self-taught Austrian school guy. Uh, and then I just went from there, just ate it up and just started reading as much as I could. And then it all, everything all started to fall into place because that's the one that's thing. That's the recurring theme. Every single guest we've had on Anarchast, yeah. they say, as soon as I found out about this stuff, I voraciously ate it up. And yeah. they, they use all the same terms and I was the same way. I, yeah. As soon as I found out about what the, Doug Casey was writing, I spent a month just reading anything I could get from yeah. the guy. And that's what happens because it expands your mind so much and yeah. it just blows you away because we've been so indoctrinated and so brainwashed in this culture with all the media and the government and going to s government schools. They don't yeah. teach you any of this stuff. Uh, and so it's it's really, uh, it's always, that's my favorite part of uh, doing Undercast is hearing the stories of how people got into it because it's all, almost always the same sort of story. It's just, wow, when I found it, it's yeah. just boom. And I'm sorry, but uh, we're actually running out of time. And okay. uh, I know you have to run, so we'll just do a short one here today. Uh, but it's been a real pleasure. Uh, yeah. Redmond from the uh, Mises Canada, and uh, Mises Canada website's up now, right? So, yeah, uh, we've been up uh, for about 30 seconds. Months. Yeah, uh, www.mises.ca. Um, and do you sell books there? Or? Uh, we, we sell books through a, another organization called uh, Books for Business. But yeah, we're not selling books right now. But we've got a conference coming up in Toronto, uh, August 20, uh, October 22nd at U of T on monetary policy. Great. Well, okay. Hopefully I can make it to that one. Yeah, that would be excellent. All right. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And join us next time on Anarchast.